Much of how scientists think about complex networks is inspired by two simple models. Lattice graphs with perfectly regular wiring and random graphs with perfectly random wiring. Lattices are well understood. This regular order, where every node has the same degree, occurs in many natural and man-made systems. But most systems are a little more disorderly. It's very important that uh, if, in referring to complexity that we talk about the regularities of the entity that we're trying to describe and distinguish them from random features that are taken to be random or incidental. Historically, people looked at the simplest case, which is everyone coupled equally to everyone else. Like a square lattice, each node has four neighbors, and it's regular. Everybody has four neighbors. In most of these networks that we're interested in, we see this great variability in the degree. In complex networks, who is connected to whom is not an easy question to answer. It's complex. But a model of randomly wired graphs would help explain complex connectivity. It would be a benchmark, an upper bound on the possible wildness of organization. In 1959, mathematician Paul Erdos discovered just such a model of random graphs. He was trying to prove a theorem about cocktail parties Erdos observed that if a host tells a guest about his secret stash of brandy, the beverage won't last the night. He began to wonder if a cocktail party could be modeled by a graph of social connections generated by random mingling. And if the brandy secret would spread quickly through this random graph. With mingling in mind, Erdos constructed a random graph model, the benchmark of connectivity that is used to this day. The random graph model and its generalizations have been used to describe many features of complex networks. Social networks are extremely rich in triangles, and yet these purely random graphs random networks have almost no triangles. And so there's sort of this dissonance between the simplest model and that. The standard random graph studied in the 50s and 60s is not, it turns out, a good model for the way real networks behave. However, it turns out that they can be generalized. But real networks are not really random. In real networks, links are formed based on criteria. These are the mechanisms by which networks order themselves. These mechanisms can be numerous and interdependent, making real networks very ordered, but very complicated. However, we can model these complicated mechanisms more simply, as partially random. Using our knowledge of order and randomness, we can explore what happens in between and improve our bounds on network complexity. In 1998, a graduate student at Cornell University named Duncan Watts did just that. He and his advisor, Stephen Strogatz, created a graph model that mapped the unexplored region between order and randomness. What uh, Duncan Watts and Steve Strogatz proposed in this paper in 1998, which touched off a lot of renewed interest in the small world problem, was to think about networks as a superposition of structured and random networks. Their ideas were inspired by crickets. Large groups of crickets chirp in unison, like a big buggy choir. 
talked about the synchrony of, of populations of crickets uh, chirping and, and, and that was a project that I was actually working on when I started to wonder about this question of how it was that the oscillators, in this case the, the crickets, were connected to each other. The reason was not that we care about crickets so much, we, we didn't, but, um, but that they would provide a nice biological example of a real system of oscillators really synchronizing. How can large groups of crickets synchronize their song when each cricket can only listen to a few of its neighbors? It must be related to connectivity. Watts proposed that crickets listen mostly to their nearest neighbors with a few random eavesdrops. And it seemed implausible to me that uh, the standard assumption, which is that everything is coupled equally to everything else, uh, was accurate for something as sort of messy and physical and uh, as a tree full of crickets. The probability of just making one what we later called a shortcut, or just connect to someone kind of at random, that was the thing that really affected the um, the overall smallness of the, the world. What they found um, was that if you sprinkle in even a few of these random connections for each person, then the world goes from having these very long paths between people to having these very short paths. Watts's small world model had just the right properties to allow cricket synchrony and to explain a well-known property of social networks, that everyone is at most six handshakes away from each other. Have you ever heard about this idea that you're only uh, ever six handshakes from the President of the United States? We're all just six handshakes apart, not just from the President, but from anybody. And so Duncan put those two ideas together in his head, the crickets and this strange kind of connectivity where everyone is close to everybody. And he wondered what would happen if a network were connected like that. If I think of a friend of mine from college who grew up in a country halfway around the world and I think of their parents and the friends of their parents and the people that they know, it seems like in a few steps I could be anywhere at all in the world. In 1966, the famous social psychologist Stanley Milgram devised an experiment to test the notion of six degrees of separation. He gave packages to a number of people in the Midwest with instructions to send their packages to a target individual in Boston. They were instructed to do this by passing the package to an acquaintance, one who was likely to know the target. Milgram found that the packages reached their target in an average of six jumps. Pretty amazing for a country of 200 million people. Milgram's result was the first evidence of six degrees of separation in social networks and stimulated scientific and popular interest. Milgram's results suggested that everyone in the world, or at least everyone in the US in the 1960s, was connected to each other through some short chain of intermediaries. If I were to go on a visit to India and uh, talk to some arbitrary person in the street, it's at first it would seem very unlikely there are only six, but I actually tried that game and it turned out it was six. Watt's model provided a mathematical explanation for this common network property. With the addition of only a few random ties, the lattice graph changes quickly from a long chain to a short one. With only a few distant acquaintances, the world becomes small. The point is I can take a, a, a very structured network, the kind of network you might have seen 3,000 years ago when most people only knew others who were geographically very close to them. All I have to do is sprinkle in a very little bit of randomness and suddenly I have a small world. It got small very fast. It didn't take many of these shortcuts to shrink the world tremendously. The same is probably true of social networks of acquaintance in the world in general. Information such as news and rumors, and jokes and fashions should spread quickly just because there's a short distance from anybody to anyone else. The small world model and random graph models have laid the theoretical foundation for network science. In the following lesson, you'll learn more about these models and the properties of real networks that they help to explain.